so be it. So be it. And so anytime, this is, this is something good for you. Like anytime you're at church and the preacher or the teacher says something really good and you agree with that, it agrees with your spirit, you can say amen. And anytime they say something that's just like not good, you can say, oh, me. All right? And I'm thankful that I hear a lot of amens around here. <laughs> Hallelujah. So um, we're, in, uh, we're in week four of our end time series. And, man, I'll tell you, it's just hard to transition from that just, you know, to this. Uh, but this, is, this has been a great series. I planned on doing this for six weeks, and so far it's moved up to eight weeks. And I'm not in a hurry for this because I really feel, I really feel in my spirit to, uh, to go more detailed into some of the teaching. Uh, but we're, we've been looking at understanding the end time and the book of Revelation. Next week we're going to be breaking down the book of Daniel. I'm telling you, there's so much, there's so much. I mean, the book of Revelation, and I'm, I'm, maybe after we get done with this series on Sunday, I'm praying about it. I may just go into, we'll go through the whole entire book of Revelation on a Wednesday night. And uh, Steve has got, you've got a few more weeks. He's doing a teaching series out of the book of Colossians, which has been, it's been harmonizing and, and accenting and, and strengthening even, you know, what I've been talking about. And so maybe after you get done with that, I'll just do a whole series on the book of Revelation. Because there's just no way that you can do a whole entire book of the Bible, you know, do it any justice in a couple of weeks, you know. And so we're just, for one service today, we're going to break down, uh, well, really two services. Because we did Revelation 1, 2, and 3. Um, so we'll pick up at, ver at uh, chapter 4. And then we're going to go from Revelation chapter 4 basically all the way to the end right now. This is not going to happen. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then next week we're going to do the, the book of Daniel, okay? But like I said, it's just an overview and it's just really to give you, hopefully to whet your appetite to study the, your, your Bibles. And I, I want to say this before I go into this. Uh, we're, we're looking at end time Bible prophecy. We've been looking at the book of Revelation. Some of you, if you haven't been here, I've said this for every service. So I want you to know that when you're studying it, the book of Revelation says, blessed is he who reads the book, not understands. So I want you to know it's a very, very, very difficult book to completely under. You're not going to completely understand the book of Revelation. Okay, until those things that are revealed, until, I mean, the Bible in itself is, it's the living word, and you can study it a thousand lifetimes and still not understand all of the mysteries of God. And so blessed is he who reads it, okay? And yes, you will understand, there are things that you will understand, there are things that we know that we're in the last days, so there are things that we, you know, we have a really good grasp on. And there are differences of opinion, you know, when you're studying the book of Revelation. And I think probably one of the, some of the most common ones was, uh, you know, the relationship of the catching away or the rapture of the church uh, to the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation period. So you have what they call uh, pre-trib, which means that the rapture takes place and then the seven-year tribulation begins and then the second coming of the Lord happens at the end of the seven-year tribulation at the Battle of Armageddon. And then you have the what they call mid-tribs, which people believe that the rapture of the church actually happens during the time of the great tribulation in the middle where the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple and declares himself to be God. And we're going to go over some of that stuff today. And then there's what's called the post-trib, which means that the second coming and the rapture happen simultaneously. So Jesus comes back and the church comes up and, and all of that happens right there. And then the battle of, Ar of Armageddon. And then there's just, there's so much. And like I said, I got out my Nelson Bible study chart last week. Man, you want to talk about, I mean, just there's so much stuff. So I encourage you, to just, this is just going to whet your appetite. And I'm pretty much, uh, the, more, the most common belief is what they call a pre-trib. I've grown up that way, but I've, I also see some very strong points on some of the other beliefs. But here's the bottom line. 
Jesus is coming back. There will be a tribulation period, and he will come back. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. And I just want to encourage you, there's nothing wrong with studying. I think the most important thing is that you build a good foundation first. You know, you build a good foundation, uh, you know, stay with, you know, what's commonly believed and then work from there. Keep your base and then go out and start learning, you know, some of the other things, you know, some of the other, look at, you, you will learn a lot of stuff. And there are some good strong points on, you know, I'll just say that. Understanding the book of Revelation is not a, uh, a heaven or hell issue. It, it's not a salvation issue, okay? All right? Once you've received Christ, you're saved, you're learning and you're growing and you're never going to understand all the mysteries of God. There are things that God told Daniel to seal up, to shut up the book and don't write them down. There's things that God told John who wrote the book of Revelation to seal those things up and, write, and not to write them. And, you know, and, and there are things that there, there's, that talks about in the book of Revelation that the seven thunders uttered. We, we have no idea what that stuff is. People will say they know what it is. People will say they know who the Antichrist. People People have been saying they know who that the Antichrist has been every president since I've been born. I'm telling you. And I went to a Christian school, and every every president, I would always hear somebody come in, you know, and they would say, you know, President so and so, you know. Now, I mean, of course, now, you know, <laughs> it's just it's just getting crazy. So, and people would say they know the time and the hour, you know. Somebody said, I, you know, God spoke to me. I got a revelation, and or an angel of the Lord appeared to me and gave me this mathematical equation, and I was able to figure out the exact month the day, the date, what year, all of that stuff, you know, when Jesus is coming back and here's why and they wrote books and they sold a lot of books and listen, don't listen to those people, okay? The coming of the Lord is imminent and it can happen at any time when God gets ready to wrap things up, okay? So how many of you have had a little bit of experience reading the book of Revelation, maybe set in, in a Bible study? And how many of you have heard of the book of Revelation? Okay, so, and those of you who haven't, that's the last book of the Bible. And the last book of the Bible, it talks about how, oh man, it's just, it, it will blow your mind when you start reading it and you start harmonizing it or coupling it with the rest of what the Bible says. And it will blow your mind of the accuracy of prophecy. It is 100% accurate. All the prophecies that have been prophesied thousands of years ago, you know, that the writers wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit, they spoke of the coming of the Messiah the first time, and people would read those, and they, 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 would, they, they really didn't have much of an idea what that stuff was talking about until the Messiah came, and then there were some people who understood. They said, this is that sign. This is that prophecy, and Jesus spoke prophecies out of his own mouth and said, I am fulfilling this prophecy, and it is 100% accuracy. So that tells us you can put your faith and your trust in the Word of God because God is big enough to create the heavens and the earth and the universe, speaks the stars into existence. He created us. He can preserve his Word word. I hear people say, well, it's been tampered with. It's been this and it's been that. And it just, he's God. He's God. And, and, and the more you study and the more you get into looking at the, uh, you know, the proof of Christianity and the existence of God, the more you become a believer. I'm telling you, there have been people throughout history that have set out to make it their life's go to prove that Christianity is wrong, that God doesn't exist, that Jesus never existed, or if he did exist, he was a lunatic, or he was out of his mind, or he was just a great teacher. And they went to do, they went to prove that wrong, and they've ended up becoming Christians. They were converted because of the evidence is overwhelming. Well, it's not even in my notes, but let's get, let's get on track here because I got to move. I got 30 minutes. It's not going to happen. Look at your neighbor and say, it's not going to happen. So, so the first week, let's, let's pray. Let's pray over the Lord. Father, just have your way. Lord, I just I pray that you would speak to us, that the uh, Holy Spirit just come and, and, and just nudge us, convict us, open up our hearts, open up our understanding. Do what you need to do in this house today. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first week, we answered the question, are we there yet? So yes, we are. We've learned that we are the generation that would see the coming of the Lord. The question is, is what a, a generation is that can be debated. Okay. Uh, week three, 
ready for his turn. Well, what do I need to do to be ready? The thing that you need to do to be ready for his turn is to be saved, okay? And then th- the week three, we went over the love letters to the church in uh, the book of Revelation. Kind of we did Revelations 1, 2, and 3. Um, Jesus gives us instructions on how to be ready. So he wrote these letters to the churches that actually uh, are relevant even to churches that are in existence uh, today. And so today, which is week four, we're going to break down Revelation, the whole entire book of Revelation some more. I've got some uh, graphics that go along with each point. Um, and we'll go ahead, if you don't care, Blair, let's start with the order of events. I don't know if I stuck that in that file, but we put it, huh? Oh, you see, he's one step ahead of me. He's on it. So we'll put that up there so everybody can see that. This is the most common uh, teaching and like I said, well, look at this. You, wow, I have a laser pointer. Look at that. <laughs> All right. So right here, y'all are laughing. <laughs> I was pushing, I was pushing the, uh, the off button last week. I'm glad I didn't turn it off. But. So the church age is the age that we live in. So from the time that Jesus was crucified, okay, that marks... The death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. So, you know, our date is A.D., after Christ, okay? So, after died. And so, from the time of the crucifixion began what's called the church age. But technically, the church didn't begin until on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, which was, you know, not long after the crucifixion. Um, And so, that puts us... In this age right here, it's what's called the church age. And so what we're awaiting for is the catching away, the rapture of the church. And like I said, one belief, the most commonly held belief, believes that the rapture takes place and then the seven-year tribulation begins. Another belief means, believes that the rapture actually takes place right here in the middle of the tribulation. And then the rapture, another belief, believes that it happens right here at the second coming. The second advent of Christ is the second coming. And so nothing wrong with any of those, but I will tell you this, the pre-trib belief doesn't play around because you have to be ready. So I think, you know, to me that, that, that speaks volumes because we have to have our hearts prepared. We have to have our hearts ready. So but so that's just for you to look at, and then we'll start putting some more things up here. Um, chapters 4, Revelation, we're going to start with Revelation chapter 4. So the scene actually shifts to heaven. And the, so we got finished looking at the, at the, at the seven letters uh, to the seven churches in Asia Minor during that time. And so Revelation chapter 4 and 5 actually, you know, it's, we're in the throne room in heaven. And, and here again, like I said, this is the most common teaching. So we have the rapture of the church. And I believe this, uh, I believe this could be the rapture, Revelation 4 and 1. Look at this, okay? It says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me. So we know that at the last trump, the Bible says at the last trump, that's when, you know, the, the, the coming of the Lord happened. So he says here, I heard uh, as if it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And so between chapters one and three, there are 18, I, this is interesting, there's 18 mentions of the word church or churches, but from chapter four on, you don't see the word church mentioned anymore. Just something interesting to think about right there. First Thessalonians, Jesus actually said that I'm going to rescue you from the coming wrath, okay? I did not appoint you to suffer wrath, is what he tells us. Uh, Second Thessalonians says that I'm going to remove the restraining force. That restraining force is the Holy Spirit that's operating through the church, which is going to enable the Antichrist to do his work, all right? So you think about it right now. The church exists on earth to be the light of the world. The church is empowered by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Whenever we receive Christ, he fills us with his spirit, okay? And, and so we're empowered. And you think about that for a minute. If the church is taken out of here, the light of the world is not here. The empowered church, the people of the church are not here. The Christians are they're gone. 
And so during that seven-year period, that's literally when all hell begins to break loose on earth, and you see all these things happen. And, and so you think about that, that restraining force. If the church has removed all the prayers that's going forth, all of, all of the, you know, the anointing, all, all of that stuff, that, that, that whole concept is gone. It's not here anymore. So belief in a pre-trib rapture is the most difficult position out of all the others to believe because it requires you to be ready. You see, there's going to be very predictable events during the tribulation that will allow you to get yourself ready. And if you fall into a, a or it, it will fall into a definite calendar, whereas the pre-trib rapture, you just got to be ready. Look at your neighbor and say, you just got to be ready. You just got to be ready. There's an urgency. You see, there's, there's the tribulation. That's the next thing. So we looked at uh, the rapture of the church. I think we had a picture of that. As I go through each one of these points, you can put a picture up there. Uh, just a picture. That's, it may look like that. It may not. This just gives us something to kind of connect with, okay? That's all we're doing here. I like to have fun with this. I like visuals. Y'all like this? I like it. Okay, the next one is the tribulation. So any picture you have up there that looks really scary with like uh, wars, uh, army, stuff like that, that would be a, good, <laughs> that would be a pretty good one because we're going to get into some stuff right here today. So the tribulation is a seven years, it's a seven year period that actually begins with the Antichrist. We're going to talk about the Antichrist today. The Antichrist actually signs a peace treaty or a pact with the nation of Israel. I have already taught you that Israel is God's prophetic time clock and keeping your eyes on Israel. And in 1948 was, you know, the, the parable of Jesus talking about the budding of the fig tree uh, nation, you know, would be birthed in, in a day. 1948, Israel became a nation again. And so, and that is the generation that would see the coming of the Lord. So that's very significant. And so they'll make, the Antichrist will actually make a peace treaty uh, with the nation of Israel. And this ant- uh, the Antichrist is, is going to look like a real hero. He's going to have all of the answers to the world's problem. He's going to be a, a charismatic guy. I mean, right now we're seeing in our nation and even in our world polar extremes. You know, I mean, people, you, go, you get on Facebook and it's just like, you know, people get offended. People get all bent out of shape. I mean, sometimes you just don't want to be even get on there. I mean, it just makes you sick of how people just take it so far over to one end or the other. And so these polar extremes is, is division. And so we're going to have a person that's going to come on the scene and he's going to bring all of this, this division. He's going to bring all of these people together. They're going to say, this is the man. This is both sides. They're going to say, he's got all the answers. This is the guy. Think about that. It says that they're going to worship him. He's going to have false signs and wonders. Uh, well, I'm kind of jumping ahead just a little bit. but So the Antichrist is going to look like a real hero with all answers to all of the world's problems. And mark this. So the, the, the tribulation period is seven years, but it's broken up into two parts, three and a half years into the tribulation. And next week we're going to be talking about this in the book of Daniel. Daniel gives us a lot of information about this, okay? It's actually called Daniel's 70th week, and I'm going to break that down into a chart for you. But so what is the Antichrist? What is the Antichrist, okay? 1 John 2 and 18 actually speaks of the Antichrist. He says, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist has come, and even now many Antichrists have come. Many Antichrists, people saying they are the Christ. There's a spirit of Antichrist, and the spirit of Antichrist is anything that would deny Christ, okay? Anything that are even false prophets and false teachers that say they, they are the Christ. Jesus talks about that. But this is how we know it is the last hour. The specific term Antichrist is used seven times in Scripture, and the meaning of the term Antichrist is simply against Christ, Okay, so anything that is against Christ is anti-Christ. And as the Apostle John records in 1 and 2 John, an antichrist denies the Father and the Son. It does not acknowledge Jesus and denies that Jesus came in the flesh, okay? There have been many antichrists, is what the Scripture tells us, but there is also the one coming antichrist, all right? Most Bible prophecy... uh, 
Bible, uh, end time Bible study eschatology es- experts believe that the Antichrist will be the ultimate embodiment of what it means to be against Christ. Okay, so in the end times, which is the last hour, a man will arise and he will oppose Christ and his followers more than anyone else in history and likely claiming to be the true Messiah and the Antichrist will seek world domination and will attempt to destroy all the followers of Christ and the nation of Israel. There is so much hostility. The Bible also prophesizes in the last day that Israel would be at Jerusalem, would be a cup of trembling. And if you look on the map, if you go and you look in the Middle East and you look at Israel and you look at all of the countries surrounding, just start making a big circle and let that circle get bigger. All of them, they want, they want the Jewish people annihilated. They want, to, they want to blow that place off of the face of the map. A cup of trembling. And so we're, we're, we're in a time right now where pretty much the only ally Israel has is the United States. Everybody else would just love to just see them just go away. We know the Holocaust. Do you know anything about the Holocaust and Hitler? I mean, he, he knew about this stuff. He wanted the Jews annihilated off of the face of the earth. Many times they've tried to do this, but you know we some of the biggest times in history is you know is during the the Holocaust, and you're going to see this. You're going to see this spirit. The spirit is on the rise. You're already seeing more hostil more hostility uh, towards Christianity than ever before. And I I've got the statistics. It will blow your mind just over the last just over the last decade. Uh, how the intensity of Christian persecution has begun to take place. We're blessed over here. You know, somebody somebody makes fun of you being a Christian. You, I've been persecuted because I'm a Christian. You have no idea what these people go through in third world countries and in communist countries and and uh, Islamic countries. I mean, they they face death. They face being beat to death, being beheaded. And, and you know, the Bible talks about, you know, uh, that there will be, you know, people who don't take the mark of the beast would be beheaded. You know, I used to read stuff like that. And I'm like, who would go that far to, you know, to cut somebody's head off? And then over, you know, over the last you know, five years. I mean, you turn on the TV, you go to YouTube, and you've, you know, you see people being beheaded. You can literally see that. I don't recommend that you watch that because it will mess you up for days. You will, you cannot ever unsee that. And you might be, you know, flipping through Google and look at pictures of the end time, and you'll see heads just laying in the street. And it's 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 crazy. It's crazy. And if you were right, we're seeing this. When I was a kid, I would read this stuff, and I was like, man, that's just, you know, wow. You, you just couldn't imagine that this stuff coming to pass, and it's happening. It is happening right before our very eyes. And so back to the Antichrist, there are other biblical references uh, that talks about that. The, uh, uh, like Daniel chapter 7 talks about the imposing, boastful king of Daniel uh, 7. He oppresses the Jews who tries to, uh, and he tries to change the set times and the laws. So maybe we'll go, go into some of these verses of Scripture when we have more time. Uh, the leader who establishes a seven-year covenant with Israel and then breaks it, Daniel chapter 9. The king who sets up the abomination of desolation, uh, Jesus talked about uh, in Mark chapter 13, and also again, Daniel chapter 9, the man of, of lawlessness, uh, the rider on the white horse representing his claim to be the man of peace, uh, the first beast, the one that comes up out of the sea in the book of Revelation chapter uh, 13, where it says that the beast receives power from the dragon, which is Satan, and speaks great words, proud words and blasphemies, and wages war against the saints, which is the church. And so thankfully, the Antichrist, the beast, along with the false prophet, there will be two people, mind you, okay, so you have the Antichrist who will be a political leader, and then you will have the false prophet who will be a religious leader, okay? And so these two people, uh, you know, the Bible tells us that they will be thrown into the lake of fire where they will spend all eternity, so what is the Antichrist? In summary, to, to, to make the long story 
Short, the Antichrist is the end time false Messiah who seeks and likely achieves world domination so that he can destroy Israel and all of the followers of Jesus Christ. They will be made during the tribulation period. This says it talks about the mark of the beast, that and it, that his number is six hundred and sixty-six, and that there's like five different directions I can go right here. So let's try to stay on. Uh, let's try to stay on target right here. But this uh, this number will be on your forehead or it'd be on your right hand, and. Uh, <laughs> Y'all pray for me so I can stay on target because I got a lot of stuff right here. But if you take this mark, if you take this mark, then you're 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 doomed. You know, it's that's it. There's no turning back because I, I think it's interesting, and this is one of the directions I was going to go. But the Jews understand that the, you know the forehead and the right arm would be a place of a, a power and authority, the place of allegiance. So what that means is is that people will give their allegiance to the Antichrist. They will be so far gone so far away from the things of God that, you know, and they're going to find this person that has all the answers and claim himself to be a Messiah. And like I said, he's going to work wonders and miracles and he's just, he's going to be the guy. I mean, people will fall down and worship him. And so, yeah, if he offers a mark, says you take this mark, then you're swearing allegiance to me and, and people are going to do that. They're just going to be falling all over this guy because he's going to have all of the answers. Think about that for a minute. I mean, you're, people, people are looking for somebody that's got all the answers. There is a spirit of Antichrist, and I want to talk about that just a little bit, just a little bit right here. So, but the Antichrist is the end time false Messiah who seeks and likely achieves world domination, domination so that he can destroy Israel and the followers of Jesus. But this phrase, a spirit of Antichrist, is actually found in 1 John 4. Um, two verses two through three, and here's what it says. It said, "This is how you can recognize the spirit of God." Okay, every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. That was 2,000 years ago, and there was a spirit of Antichrist that was beginning to grow. And this was a letter to the church. This is talking about the church. This was in the church, or not a letter to the church, but this was written you know, during that time. So it was there. It was, it was, it was starting to show its ugly head. So how much more, if we're in the last days, you see, this same spirit that will empower the Antichrist of the last days is currently operating in the world to bring confusion and deception to the issue of Jesus' uh, person and work. So this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. It's good stuff. Okay, let's move on to Revelation chapter 6 through 19. In 10 minutes. Y'all, what are y'all laughing at? You think that's funny? <laughs> so Revelation 6 through 19, the vast majority of Revelation is all about the seven-year period called the tribulation. And this part is the most difficult to understand because it's filled with so much symbolism. Remember, God is showing John things in our time, which is 2,000 years ago. Think about that. And 2,000 years ago, or 2,000 years later, I'm sorry, 2,000 years later, and you want to talk about a cultural gap. I mean, put yourself in John's shoes during that time. Put yourself in John's shoes and try to explain F-16 fighter jets, Apache attack helicopters, B-52 bombers, stealth droids and planes and nuclear missiles. How would you describe that? You, you couldn't say, well, you know, I saw... 2,000 years ago, John saw a, a, a written, you know, um, Apache attack helicopter. They wouldn't have known what that is until, you know, what, 50 years ago? I don't know how long an Apache attack helicopter, but it's not very old. Planes are not very old. Microwave ovens, TV. Your iPhone is not even a decade old, really. I don't, I don't think I remember the first time somebody had one, they brought it. This is not an iPhone, by the way. It's a Galaxy. Put it on camera. Two people clapped. <laughs> Everybody else said, oh, me. 
<laughs> but remember this. Remember, God is showing John things in our time, which is 2,000 years later. So let's look at, let's, I'm going to have some fun, okay? Listen to this. And we're in the book of Revelation. Uh, let's go to Revelation chapter 8, 7 through 13. Now, the first angel sounded, and there followed hell and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. And verse 8, pay close attention to this, and it says, And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. Maybe that's a volcano. I don't know. You, we'll, we'll know after it happens, but I mean, there's a lot of speculation. I'm going to speculate and have some fun with this. And you can go and study it yourself and see if you can figure out what it is, because I want you to study your Bibles. In verse 9, it says, And a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third part of the ships were destroyed, and a third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of this star is called Wormwood, and a third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now, I think this is very interesting, and again, we're just going to have fun with this because it's all you can do. But anybody ever heard of Chernobyl in Russia? Chernobyl, the, it was the worst nuclear accident that has ever happened in the history. It was in the 80s. I think it was in the late 80s, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. But they, to this day, to this day, radiation is still burning down into the earth. And they called it wormwood. Something interesting to think about. And all of the waters, you know, was being poisoned around. There are actually still scientists that are going in and, you know, they're running tests on all of the life and all of the animals, you know, they're at that place. So some people believe that the Chernobyl incident was actually, you know, this judgment. Yeah, maybe it is, maybe it's not. Very interesting, though, isn't it? So uh, maybe it was a meteor. You know, how could, how could Paul, I mean, not Paul, but how could John, you know, describe uh, a nuclear uh, facility, you know, exploding? How, or or may, like I said, maybe it was a meteor because it said, there fell a great star from heaven. So we know that meteors are, you know, coming close to the earth's atmosphere, and we know that even the one the size of a bus, if it was to hit, I mean, it would just be devastating. Uh, they've made, you know, a lot of movies about things like that. Uh, it could be nuclear missiles, stars falling from the sky. You know, maybe John saw nuclear missiles, God sending down fire from heaven. It could just be supernatural, God sending down fire from heaven. But whatever that is, it's not going to be good. All right, And it says, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and a third part of the moon, and a third part of the stars, and or so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for the third part of it, and the night likewise, maybe it could be ash from, you know, the devastation that just took place, you know? I don't know. And there's other prophecies that talks about, you know, the sun being darkened, the moon turning to blood, and the great and terrible day of the Lord. And look, verse 13, it says, And I beheld, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Whatever this was, even the angels, all they could say was, whoa. Come on. I mean, I've seen things, and I'm like, whoa. You know, I've never said, whoa, whoa. And these are supernatural beings. These are angels. Whoa. So whatever. We don't know what that is. Revelation 9, uh, 1 through 10. Uh, we'll move through this, and then I think we're getting ready. We're getting ready to about land this plane, maybe. Look at your neighbor and say, Maybe. 
Uh, Revelation chapter 9, it says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And verse 3, it says, And there came out of the smoke locusts, you can underline that, upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth having power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass or the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. So these are probably environmentalist type spirits, tree huggers, definitely. Maybe. I don't know. Let's go a little bit further. We're having fun, so don't get too serious on me. Like, <gasps> okay. But only those men which were not sealed with God in their foreheads. Okay. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he strikes a man. And in those days, men shall seek death and they shall not find it. They shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. And right here at verse 7, it says, and the shapes, it starts to describe these. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared for battle. Remember, John's seeing something 2,000 years into the future. And on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates, and it, were bre it was as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running into battle. And they had tails like scorpions, and there, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Sounds like something in the military to me. But I want us to understand that there are literal spirits that are behind these things. There are spirits behind wars. There are spirits behind, you know, all the darkness that is over regions and cities and so there will be spirits, and maybe it's describing these spirits, but these spirits are in control of, you know, what is transpiring, you know, in our world during that particular time. You know, there are spirits. When we had, I remember, you know, people telling stories of, you know, being in World War II, being in Korea and in Vietnam, and they would literally, you know, when it, they would get ambushed or there would be, I mean, in, in a bad, you know, fight, and they would literally, you know, people would tell stories of them seeing, you know, the devil, you know, walking across, you know, the battlefield or, or, or a entity or some type of a being and just laughing and mocking and, you know, and, and, and you know, people seeing all kinds of darkness, all kinds of dark things. And I know as far as Israel is concerned, anytime they've ever tried to attack Israel, there are stories about how the hand of God, and you can read in the Bible of some instances, but even during modern times where God has, you know, pushed things back, you know, people have seen a literal hand or they've seen miraculous things, you know, because God said he would, that, that's his people and he will protect his people. Israel will be undefeated no matter who comes against them. It has happened. They've never been, they've tried to wipe them off the face of the earth and they're still here. They have one of the strongest militaries in the world for this small, this little, small, little place on the map. They are bad to the bone, okay? And they have America backing them as well. And it talks about in another verse of scripture, Let's go out here a little bit and have some fun. Okay, another verse of Scripture, it talks about the, the woman uh, with the child and the woman being Israel and the child being Jesus. And, and it's in Revelation chapter 12, and it, all the way for, further on down, it talks about, you know, the, how the dragon, you know, would come against, so the devil would come against Israel. And it says that the eagle would help her. And so some people believe that that's America, because America in the last days right now is her only ally. And it's in the book of Revelation. If that's what it means, that's awesome. If it's not, it's still awesome because no matter how you look at it, Israel is coming out on top. The church is coming out on top. It is predestined. The back of the book says we win, and it will blow your mind. And this was just 
we just scratched the surface here of some of the things that, I mean, like I said, I mean, you could see John seeing all these, these, these great war machines, you know, of our time. And it just blows your mind. He, all, he th- all he could say was like, you know, horses prepared unto battle and, and, you know, the sound, the sound that they made. It was just, you know, and he just gave this description. And I, I believe that's definitely what that is. But like I said, I want you to remember there are s- literal spirits that are behind that, that are influencing that and pushing those things. Okay? Man, our grandparents and great-grandparents, they, uh, I remember my pastor's great grandfather he was telling me he was out in the field he was picking cotton and the first plane an airplane flew over and he was smoking a corn pipe they actually would make a pipe out of corn husk you know they would i guess drill it out i've seen you've probably seen them before it's you know for sale at flea markets and stuff and he saw that plane, he took that corn pipe, he threw it as far as he could, he got down on his knees and he started crying out to God because he thought it was doomsday. They'd never seen a plane. I mean, you know, seeing something flying in the sky like that. So I just think that, you know, to hear stories and how so much has changed and technology is becoming so advanced. And we were talking about uh, microchips just the other day and I actually found something I thought was very interesting. Of course, if y'all have been seeing Facebook, I had my motorcycle. My, my motorcycle was stolen. And so last night I was studying on the mark of the beast and was looking at microchips, and I thought, hmm. And I watch a lot of superhero movies, okay? I like DC and Marvel and stuff. I've always been a comic book, you know, type person. And they always, like, put, you know, they'll go up and they'll put a tracking device, you know, on Batman or something like that. I thought, if only they made, like, a microchip that you could put on your car or your motorcycle. So I Googled it. 50 bucks. Well, this is Sunday, so, you know, we'll have to order I probably on Monday. But it's going to be on my next bike, I'm telling you. Shall we stand? <laughs> One, two. Oh, we can, I, we can finish this. Do you all mind standing for about five minutes? I, it's too late. I done told you to stand. So you have to stand. And that means I've got to hurry up now, Okay. But the seven-year tribulation period ends with the second coming. We should have a picture right there. So again, this is the great event that is not a come up, but it's a come down. Revelation chapter 19, it says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. There's a picture right there. A white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his head was... uh, were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name was called the word of God and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon the white horse clothed in fine linen white and clean and 19 verse 19 says and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth all the great leaders of the earth the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the white horse against his army and so God is going to defeat the enemy when he returns as this great battle called at this great battle called Armageddon and the corrupt and the wicked world system the beast the antichrist the false prophet and all who oppose him will be cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone that's what the bible says satan will be bound locked up and in prison in a compartment in the earth for a thousand years and god will set up his kingdom and there's where the you know we have the marriage supper of the lamb wherever that takes place if it takes place during the seven year period or right after the battle of armageddon you can put that wherever it is going to happen. But understand this, God is not mad. The whole motivation of Christianity is that, is this, the whole motivation of Jesus himself is he wants to get married. He's looking for a bride. He's looking for a bride without spot, without wrinkle. And that's the bride, uh, the bride of Christ is the church. It, it, It talks about the church as she. And so, 
he's, he wants to get married. And that's why he calls the church the bride of Christ. He's coming to find his bride. He wants to be with you. He wants to have that kind of a relationship and intimacy with you and me. So the first thing that is going to take place when all of this is settled is a celebration. We're going to, uh, to be wed with Christ as the bride. Listen, Golden Corral or any buffet you've ever been to has nothing on this stuff. Imagine a thousand year period where we're going to be with Jesus on earth. You see, there's also, this is also where the judgment seat of Christ takes place. Another huge misconception. I know I'm just giving you a lot of stuff, and, but this is a lot of people think that this is where we're going to spend eternity in heaven. You know, we're going to spend eternity, in, we're going to spend the first thousand years on earth. You see, Jesus is going to reign out of Jerusalem and it will be like it was in the garden uh, in the book of Genesis. No sin, no pollution, no insurance, no traffic. The Krispy Kreme light is always on and they're free. You get what I'm saying? What a day that will be, all right? So when the thousand years is up, God is going to release Satan for a short time. And I'm not 100% sure why, but the scripture does tell us uh, it is to deceive the nations and of course you know they will overthrow him and he'll be thrown into the lake of fire once and for all and then you have the great white throne judgment and then we have the new heaven and the new earth let's go ahead and look at this this is mind blowing you see you're not going to sing a, in a choir or play the harp on a cloud for all of eternity you know there's still going to be work that's going on there should be a picture uh, the measurements of the new Jerusalem yeah, that's how large, that's the United States, but the New Jerusalem will come down, and that's the, the measurements, that's how large the New Jerusalem will be over Jerusalem. <laughs> let's, let's read about it here. The new heaven and the new earth, uh, heaven is going to be a great, a great place. It's going to be greater than anything we could imagine. I think this is a good place to close up right here because 1 Corinthians 2 and 9, it says, However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can conceive or even imagine or comprehend what God has prepared for those who love Him. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 10, it says, And He carried me away in the Spirit in a great and high mountains and showed me the great city the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God having the glory of God her light was like the most precious stone like jasper stone clear as crystal also she had a great and high wall and the twelve gates and the twelve angels at the gates and the name was written and names were written on them which were the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel and three gates on the east three gates on the north and three gates on the south and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city and it gives the measures and it gives the description of what it's going to be like. And on in verse 22 it says that the glory talks about the glory of the new Jerusalem. But I saw no temple in it for God, for the Lord God Almighty, the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need for the sun or the moon to shine and the glory of God illuminated. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in the light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor to it. Its gates shall not be shut uh, at all by day. There shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and the honor and the nations to it. But there shall by no means enter in anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Wow. I have not seen, your eye, nothing that you've seen, nothing, even the way that the Bible describes it, all the Bible can do, all the writers could do was describe it in terms that we can comprehend. It's nothing like you've ever seen, nothing like you've ever heard, heard nothing like you could ever imagine. That's what I'm talking about. This is the hope. This is the promise. This is why we're learning about this. This is the song that says, oh, what a day it will be. You know, when you hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter in 
and we, we're just going to be doing, you know, Pat, you know, I'm going to see you up there, and I'm going to be like, yeah, we did, you are here, come on, we're going to dance, and we're going to fly, hey, we're going to fly, we're going to be like the superheroes that we watch, you know, that's, this is going to be awesome, that's exciting, this is what it's all about, yes, yes. See, that's what's good about learning about the Bible because you do see that there is wrath to come. There is a judgment to come. But to those who believe and those who have trusted and endured and kept their faith and trust in Him, oh, what a blessing that's going to be. So all over the house and everybody for the second service, come on in. Just come on in, and, and I'm going to open up this altar, this area. If you would like to have prayer, I'm going to pray over you right now. Let's just do it that way. How about that? Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you bless every person that has heard your word today. Lord, those who, who know you, have been walking with you for a while, that they've been encouraged, that they've just been re-energized today with, with your word. Those who are searching for you today, Lord, I pray that you would just minister, Lord. If they don't know you, that they would just ask you to come into their heart. They would repent of their sins, ask for forgiveness, and, and receive restoration. Hallelujah. And Lord, all, every person in this place, those that are coming in, those that may be leaving, or whatever, Lord, that you just do your thing, Lord God. There's nothing that I can do to save anybody. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves, but that you have to do the work. But all we have to do is cry out to you and talk to you. If you would like salvation today, this altar is open. When I say altar, that means you can just come down. You know, Jesus doesn't want us to be ashamed of him. And sometimes it's a matter. I remember when I was in church the first time and I wasn't living right and the preacher was preaching, man, and I was tore up. And my fingernails are still, if that pew is still in that church today, my fingernail indentions are on that because I was, I was scared. I was fighting God because why? I wanted to go down there. I knew I needed God, but I, I didn't feel like I, I was ready to change my life. I still had drugs in my life. I still had the lifestyle. I still had all of those things. And I was just like, I don't know if I'm ready. I, I want to do that. My spirit wanted to, but my flesh was like, I was just hanging on. And so I was like fighting. You know, I mean, I was like this. My spirit was, was, was reaching for the altar and my flesh was holding on. And it wasn't long after that, it broke. And I just, I went down. I went down boldly. I didn't care what anybody thought. I didn't care what anybody thought about anything. I went down to the altar and I gave my life to Christ. That day, something real happened. That day, it changed me forever. And I was brought up in a Christian school and in church and I would said the sinner's prayer many times. But that day, I was born again. That day changed me forever. And that's what I'm talking about today. Hallelujah. We got to change. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to, you come come on up here, Jeannie. Uh, if you need to take over, you're going to take the wheel. Because the other church, the other service is coming in. So stay, fellowship, pray, do whatever you need to be doing. My wife is here. Pat is down here. We have a prayer team. This altar is open. If you want to come down for prayer, Come on down. Hallelujah.